Welcome, and thank you for joining us this evening. I'm Kathleen Rourke from Candlewick Press, and I'm delighted to have the honor of introducing the seventh episode in the Black Creator Series, a collaboration between the Teachers College Reading and Writing Project and Candlewick Press, hosted by Sonia Cherry Paul, Director of Diversity and Equity at Teachers College Reading and Writing Project. Tonight, we welcome author Michael Bandy, whose first two picture books with Candlewick Press White Water and Granddaddy's Turn both received NAACP Image Awards for Outstanding Literary Work for Children. His third title, just published in fall 2020, Northbound, A Train Ride Out of Segrega Segregation, received two starred reviews and was described by Kirkus as painful history portrayed honestly and beautifully to help children understand the very personal impact of racism. Sonia and Michael will be able to reply to comments during the presentation, so we invite you to see, use the comments section to ask questions. Thank you for joining us and enjoy the conversation. Michael, how are you? Thank you for joining us. Uh, it is a pleasure, Sonia. Uh, I am doing great. Uh, I'm uh, coming to you from here in, in uh, Southern California, which is kind of chilly outside. Okay. Uh, yeah, unusual for this time of year, but uh, between Los Angeles uh, and, and Las Vegas, and uh, I, I live in Las Vegas, but I work here in Los Angeles, uh, it's nearly 90 degrees at home. Okay. Wow. Not quite the same in, uh, in New York, but... Uh... Uh, we're enjoying spring and we are grateful for, for all of the sunny days. And Michael, I wanted to talk to you about actually not necessarily where you live now so much, but I know that you grew up in the South. And could you tell us a little bit about where you grew up? And, you know, can you share a bit about your childhood and what it was like to be a young Black boy in the South? Well, uh, I grew up in a, a small town in Alabama called uh, uh, Opelika. Opelika, I said, well, where is that? Well, Opelika is, uh, I'll get you some uh, 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 marks. It's uh, uh, 70 miles south of Atlanta, uh, 30 miles west of uh, the uh, Columbus uh from Columbus, Georgia, and about uh, 65 miles north of Montgomery, Alabama, and right next to Tuskegee, we're only 13 miles away. Um, growing up uh, as, a, as a young black kid in Alabama, uh, particularly during um, uh, a turbulent time, it was different. It was different because we accepted a lot of things that were happening, especially as kids. And do we as kids, um, did I think about segregation? Probably not as much as you would imagine because uh, while uh, there were two identities, black and white, we had our own school, we had our own doctors, we had our own stuff. And um, uh, there were certain protocols that as a young child, you knew what to do and what not to do. And uh, I can remember going to uh, town with my uh, grandmother because my grandmother raised me and having to cross the other side of the street um, when we rode the bus, we would uh, uh, catch the bus on the rural route where we lived and uh, we paid our fare and then got off the bus, walked to the back, got on the bus again. So um, I always thought that um, besides uh, the inconvenience of it all, it wasn't a, a very smart way <laughs> in, uh, in, in loading a bus. But uh, that's the way it was. And when we got to town to the bus station, uh, they had their side. We had our side. So the idea of, 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 inter, of uh, segregation was unfortunately ingrained in us all. Yeah. Uh, and we would hear uh, 
uh, about changes that were going to come. Uh, and uh, goodness gracious, Sonia, I can remember um, once uh, uh, going into town and uh, the local uh, white establishment was not happy about uh, Martin Luther King and these young upstarts coming down to Alabama, stirring up their, their good colors, as they would say. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember seeing KKK uh, parades down Main Street in Opelite. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, in one of your books, which we'll talk about next, um, in the author's note, you talked about you know, not only um, the bar the obvious barriers of, of segregation um, for Black people and for young Black people in particular, uh, but you also talk about self-doubt as a barrier. Um, and I'm wondering if you would just talk a little bit more about that. And would you say this kind of self-doubt that you faced was born of racism and also whether or not you see this as a barrier, not just in the past for young black people, but also today? Uh, good questions. Number one, yes. Uh, self-doubt was real because of the, because of segregation. Mm -hmm. um, the self-doubt came about because when you saw vistas of other things happening, you wondered to yourself, hey, can I do those things? Yeah. Uh, one particular example was uh, me going to Ohio with my grandmother on the train. And, and uh, throughout that journey, there were states that were segregated and they put the sign up. So I wasn't comfortable in my own psyche. Well, just down the road, it seems like things were different. Yeah. And, and, and I remember getting to Atlanta, Georgia. And uh, we're in the train station. And I recall it was one of the most beautiful edifices that I've ever seen in my entire life. And I... I asked my grandma, I said, Ma, can I go to the restaurant? And she said, yes, just be careful. And I remember reading the signs in the restroom and uh, uh, there was men, women, and I didn't know which restroom to go into. Obviously, it can't go into women. The men, I assumed that it was segregated because I've only gone to segregated restrooms all my life. And I saw a gentleman, uh, his profession, he was a red cap. And he said, I asked him, I said, sir, where's the colored restroom? And he said, son, there is no colored restroom in here. He said, just go in there. I said, in here? And he said, yes. And I remember going to the restroom and these white men <laughs> were near me. And I not to sound obtuse, I couldn't go potty because of that self-doubt. Yeah. Segregation is something that's insidious. It, uh, it, 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 it's like a disease. It comes mm -hmm. through your pores, but in this case, it's those psychological pores. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and we uh, don't, we have to find the antibodies that that can cure that disease because that's yeah. what it is. Yeah. And I think, you know, uh, I have my, my father grew up in the segregated South and I, you know, I'm familiar with stories like the ones you're, you're sharing. And, you know, when I think about young people today and self doubt, you know, I think about that imposter syndrome that so many of us battle. It doesn't matter if you um, are the most accomplished or have the most degrees in the room, you're still, there's this, you know, part of you that's still trying to um, navigate those, those feelings of, of, of belonging and worthiness and um, 
one thing that's so important for educators is to to remember to do is to is to affirm um, you know racial and cultural identities of of the students that have particularly been uh, marginalized in the United States because we have to battle this. They, you know to understand it's a battle that um, that so many Black and Brown um, children and people. Um, you know, are just are just dealing with um, as young people and 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 even into their adulthoods, right? Yeah, and, and and through their adulthood, and I like the word navigate through their adulthood, and then it passes on to their kids, and uh, so it's a perpetual thing. Yeah, uh, and I remember talking to our agent years ago about writing something to kids and uh, not to sugarcoat it. And the prevailing wisdom is that, well, that's not necessarily marketable. Yep. Uh, but uh, thank goodness that the Candlewood Press didn't think so. And um, we have been able to tell. Yes these experiences uh, to a new generation. Uh, and I want to let, can we, can we talk about one of them? Because you, you are telling these stories and you're not sugarcoating them, as you say, or whitewashing them as you, as, as I might say. And, and one of them is, is white water and the symbolism that you bring to the fountain in this is just so powerful. And, and this story is inspired by your life growing up in the South. Um, yes. So could you tell us a little bit about this gorgeous story that's co-written by Eric Stein and illustrated by Shadra Strickland? Um, no, just, and I'm just gonna show everyone a, a little bit of this beautiful book. Well, thank you. Uh, Whitewater. Um... Uh, this wonderful labor of love happened from an experience that I told uh, uh, my writing associate years earlier that I had gone into town and uh, and uh, my my cousin we went by White's only drinking fountain and so he and he being light skinned I said go ahead and drink some water and tell me what it's like. And uh, the naivete of kids. Um, and what happened is there was a, a, a white woman who saw us at the whites only fountain. She yelled at us. I fell. And then I ultimately saw that it was two pipes, I mean, one pipe feeding two fountains. So then I had this epiphany. Either they're not the smartest people in the world, or uh, I have accepted or we have accepted a truth that uh, wasn't reality. Yeah, so and I just love, I love the realization of, of the fountain. Um, I love how the realization of the fountain becomes a realization about untruths, as you just yes. said. Um, untruths that absolutely impact the way Black children see themselves in the world. And, and I wasn't aware of this at the time, Michael, but I think this was turned into a short film. Um, do you well, want to talk actually, about that? Actually, yes, actually, um, uh, it, it became a short screenplay, uh, which one... Uh, which I'm very proud, uh, won several awards. And uh, then um, uh, it was uh, turned into uh, a major um, uh, television uh, feature, um, which uh, uh, I'm extremely happy about. Matter of fact, Whitewater won uh, the largest television uh, audience during that time for uh, its premiere. Lorenz Tate uh, starred in it, and uh, Sharon Leal, uh, Barry Henley, Shabaka, 
uh, and uh, several others. Um, Storm Reed, who's gone on to do a, a myriad of wonderful things. Um, our film uh, is one of those things that you think about and uh, uh, TV One uh, bought the rights and we were fortunate to shoot it in Opelika, Alabama of all places. So uh, we, we're very, very proud of that. Uh, there is a film festival called the Jasmine uh, Film Festival in Iran and uh, Whitewater today is the only American film that has been shown at the Iranian Film Festival. Wow, that's incredible. So, so for educators, I, I really want you to know that this is an incredible text for students to read, for, for, for you to read to your students. It's a beautiful mentor for narrative writing and it offers powerful insights for students to learn about life in the segregated South through the eyes of, of a young black boy. And then uh, maybe to follow it with, if you can access um, the, the, the movie, uh, I think that would be really amazing for, for students to see. And Michael, I wanna also talk about the, the next gift you gave to us, which is Granddaddy's Turn. And it, it actually brought tears to my eyes. And, and readers get to reconnect with the same character from Whitewater in this powerful story. Can you tell us what made you tell this story? And in what ways did you draw from your lived experiences that you've been sharing with us um, in the South to tell this story? Um. Well, uh, quite simply, I went to, the story is about uh, Michael, me, going to vote with my grandfather for the first time. And um, voting was, and still is, uh, an integral, integral part of, of um, who we are in this big fabric of what we call America. At the time, uh, he wanted me to go with him. And, uh, uh, and I thought we were going to uh, do something uh, fun. I thought we were going to the fair. And he said, no, son, we're going to do something that's more important than going to the fair. And uh, we went to vote. And uh, what's interesting is in the process of uh, my grandfather getting the ballot, ballot to vote, I remember standing in the hot sun and we had to get out of line, back into line because we're black and uh, uh, white folk kept taking their place in front of us. Um, so anyway, by the time we got to, uh, 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 my grandfather and I got to cast uh, those votes, his vote. Um, there was a deputy there and the deputy took out uh, a very large book. Uh, my grandfather couldn't read, and I remember him saying, Uncle, can you read this? And uh, my grandfather said, no, sir, I, I, I can't read it. And uh, so the, uh, the poll watcher took the uh, ballot. He said, well, you can't vote here. We don't want dummies here, and he tore it up. And not only did he throw it on the ground, but he he rubbed it in like a, a used um, uh, cigarette. Mm. And I remember walking back home with my grandfather and my grandfather, this very strong, rugged uh, outdoorsman, wouldn't take anything off of anyone kind of guy. First time in my life, I saw tears roll down his eye and uh I told my grandfather, I asked him, what's wrong? And he said, nothing. And uh, as a, a young kid, I knew exactly what the problem was. And, and without going into details and impending his, his, his angst even more, I said, granddaddy, I'll vote for you one day. And um, I remember voting for the first time. Yeah. Uh, and I voted for my grandfather. It was his turn. And even though he physically was 
never got to vote, but he understood that uh, the process of casting your vote, saying who you are, making your mark was important. And he understood that. And um, I wanted to share that experience. Um, the book, uh, the story, I mentioned the story at, at, a, at a school in Santa Monica. And um, uh, at the end, I, I had an opportunity to meet people that were there. And uh, we, we were first talking about uh, uh, Whitewater. And this young lady who looked very familiar, she said, thank you very much for telling, I come from a mixed uh, uh, family and I need to talk to my kids about race and I didn't know how to do it. And this book allowed me to do that. And she said, but that story that you told and it was one of those things where people were so emotional, a lot of crying. And she said, please write that. So, uh, you know, um, I've always been told to write what you know, know what you write. And uh, it was actress Jennifer Beals who encouraged me to, to uh, write uh, uh, Granddaddy's Turn. Uh, all of the stuff that... Uh, that we've gone through um, has it really changed? Now we have just like we had poll uh, observers, literacy tests, all sorts of stuff like that to keep them voting. Right now, it's moved into a different, more technological uh, age of uh, keeping folk from voting. Um, and I wanted and, to say, I just wanted to say, uh, Michael, I think what you're saying can sometimes be challenging for young people to understand because the law says one thing, right? And so they think that therefore everyone should be able to, you know, um, adhere to that law and have rights underneath that law. Um, but what they don't always understand is that the people who carry out the law have had the power to do otherwise when it comes to Black people. And Granddaddy's right. Turn is such a clear example of this. What advice can you share with educators about teaching about history as well as the present, particularly when it comes to laws and policing that break away from these sort of oversimplified narratives? All right, uh, good question. I, I think uh, when it comes to educating the young people or educating anyone uh, about something that's as important as this, and I, I, I like to say you hold up a mirror and you look where we've been and you look where we are. And then in the center, there is this divergent narrative of information. And so you say, how do you bridge? How do you bridge from there to here? Most young people, he are in a social media world right now. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, it's a tool. How do you get that information to use that tool to make someone feel that they are important? Well, I have to be optimistic about it because uh, with the, uh, uh, the murder of George Floyd, uh, there are people that were awakened to this atrocity, not just here in the United States, but I, I, I saw Filipinos, I saw people in Great Britain, I saw folk that protested. And it goes back to one major thing, and I'm probably selfish in looking at it this way, is that notion that if you believe in this pluralistic stuff, then you gotta be a participant. And you can't rest 
on the sideline. That is the hardest part of being motivated to get our butts out of the seat, so to speak, and do what is right. And so what happens is when you do those things that that are correct, what happens is that the opposing group or the opposing force, they become upset and they resort to things like, well, they're stealing the vote from us, et cetera, et cetera. Isn't it ironic that the same uh, interlopers that said, well, we want everybody to vote, 50 years ago, 60 years ago, are the same, they use that same logic and that same diatribe today. Yeah. So as educators, uh, you, me, uh, those folk that have uh, some influence, we have to believe what, we have to believe in it ourselves. Yeah. And, um, and, and, and promote it. Because yeah, that's what's, that's what's important. And I think it makes a difference for young people to know that as you've written in the end note, you know, thousands of Black people were denied their constitutional right to vote, right. even though the law said they could. They were harassed. They were hurt. They were killed for trying. And understanding this history has everything to do with understanding why some people have are apathetic around around voting. It has everything to do with understanding why, you know, what we see happening in Georgia, for example, with Stacey Abrams and others, yes. um, and and the response to that, with which is more voter suppression, which is what you were just um, talking about. Um, and whenever we try to engage in conversations about racism without acknowledging the pattern of systemic racism and white supremacy throughout right. the history of this nation, people are demonstrating a willful kind of ignorance, right? We're just saying stuff, but we are not willing to look at the history and, and the patterns of, of racism. Yes, and, 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 and uh, the, the notion um, that is systemic and it is systemic because it comes, uh, it, it's generational. It, yeah. well, it, it's all the way from 1619 uh, mm -hmm. to uh, 2021. Yep. Uh, and um, if, yeah. if we don't, if we don't call it out uh, by its name, well, you can't solve it. Mm -hmm. My grandmother used to say, you know what? If it bites and it's in the slithers, it's probably a snake. I have to tell you, I love your grandmother. And um, one of the things in particular, among many, that I admire about your work, Michael, is the way you spotlight and affirm um, intergenerational relationships in your work, the deep significance of young people and their relationships with, with their grandparents. And readers get to see this again in Northbound, a train ride out of segregation. And I love this one um, so much, so, so much. Tell us about Northbound and how this story came to be. Sure. Uh, Northbound, uh, the third in the trilogy of Michael's experience of growing up in the South. Uh, my grandmother and I took a trip from uh, Opelika uh, to uh, Cincinnati in the mid to uh, uh, late 60s. And um, I, my grandmother was my, well, my grandparents were my rock, but particularly my grandmother because she had the nurturing bond and she wanted to make sure that uh, if whatever I did, I needed to act like I had some sense. So uh, this train ride 
uh, gave me a different view of what segregation was all about. Because living in, in, in Opelika, I saw segregation, if I can use a simple term, from a static standpoint, I knew about the, 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 the drinking fountains. I knew about, uh, I, I, I couldn't go into Newberries and eat at the, uh, the counters. I knew about going to the back window and my grandmother picking up uh, our, uh, food at, at the back window, not being able to go in the front. But I, I, I didn't understand that segregation was, uh, was mobile. It was, it was riding that train and uh, uh, meeting uh, the expectations of what I thought the world should be was totally different. Mm. Now, I, 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 I met a white kid who got on the train in Opelika. Now, I had seen this kid before, but we, we, we didn't have a relationship. But it's interesting, growing up in the South as a kid, you could play with each other uh, regardless of race. And it seems like something happened when you got to be 13 or 14 years old. You really didn't talk to each other anymore. Yeah. But to, but to go to your question uh, specifically, looking at the narrative of this mobile uh, stuff of, uh, of uh, segregation, we would go through one state and I remember the conductor putting up uh, chains and say, you know, it's uh, it's black here, white here, black here, white here, depending on where you were. And then I started to formulate uh, thoughts in my mind. Now I don't understand the game. I don't understand the game anymore. Um, and the only thing that uh, I had for that day and a half trip from Opelika to, uh, uh, to Cincinnati was this white kid. And yeah. um, we were, the, our commonality were kids. Right. Uh, my feeling is that when the segregated signs went up, I understood it. So I went to the Michael behavior. But it's interesting when the segregated signs went up, he had more angst about that experience than I did. Mm -hmm. Why? Because he's a boy, I'm a boy, and he wanted to play. Yep. Well, I'm a boy, he's a boy. I wanted to play, but I knew because of my experiences and you use the, uh, the, the, the narrative before about self-doubt. Well, it's self-doubt. Well, hell is only a, a chain with a colored only sign, but my self-doubt is that I do not have the, I do not have the uh, ability to cross that. Yeah. Now, now, those signs were nothing but psychological barriers. And Michael, one of the things, again, many things that you do so well in your books is, is, is exactly that. You demonstrate the physical barriers brought about by racism and segregation and discrimination, but also the psychological barriers. And I wanna just read this, this page. Um, it says, but then the fun stopped. The conductor shouted, Chattanooga, Tennessee, next stop. Then he put the whites only sign back up in Bobby Ray's train car. Bobby Ray handed me a rolled up paper with a rubber band wrapped around it, but I didn't have time to look at it. The conductor whisked me down that aisle darn fast. That ain't fair, mister, said Bobby Ray. The conductor just grinned and looked back at him and kept moving me away. Seemed like the rules on that train were always changing. It just didn't make any sense at all. And that last sentence, right, seemed like the rules on that train were always changing. It just didn't make any sense at all. Um, through the eyes of young Michael, 
right? The rules are arbitrary and, and, and it's because they are and, and they're senseless. And your writing just really helps young readers to feel this, to see the world through young Michael's eyes as, as he navigates the world around him. Um, so thank you for, for doing this so um, poignantly in all three of these, these books where readers get to experience this with Michael. Well, I, I, I think too, and thank you very much. I sincerely appreciate it. I, I appreciate you um, uh, uh, giving me this form to, uh, to talk about this. Uh, but if I can make a quick point about uh, Northbound is that in, 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 in my way of thinking, 10 or 11 year old kid is that that train, and I didn't know at the time, but that train represented, represented who we are in this world. The train is moving, it's constantly moving. However, those denizens of uh, evil they pop there, uh, you know, they pop up everywhere. So Michael, what's next for you? What can young readers and also educators look forward to? Do you have any uh, new projects coming up you want to share? Uh, uh, absolutely. Uh, um, we have uh, completed uh, uh, this wonderful trilogy with uh, Candlewood Press. And uh, uh, I have wanted to whet my... Uh, 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 my whistle, so to speak, and uh, write more uh, screenplays. And uh, I'm currently um, uh, writing uh, a couple screenplays at the time. Sometimes I don't know, I, I need sleep, but uh, I, I can sleep later. But uh, uh, from an educational standpoint, um, I am working on a title uh, right now, uh, something that has troubled me is bullying. And um, so how would I uh, teach, if I, can, if I can be so selfish and use that, teach uh, folk about bullying that would be uh, palatable, accepted, and someone to really glean something out of it. So uh, creating a title where by uh, bullying is told not from the perspective of a, a kid, but bullying is told from the perspective of an animal. And uh, so um, uh, where these animals are, uh, without giving too much away, are um, expected to be a certain way, but he is different. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's what that's about. Wow. So that's a few of the things that uh, I'm currently uh, working on. Yeah, we have some we have some things to look forward to. Well, yes. Michael, your your books, um, and speaking specifically about the trilogy of about young Michael, um, they honor the the history and the and the lived experiences of of Black people. Um, from water fountains to voting, traveling by train. Um, your books demonstrate segregation in, in powerful and, and profound ways for young readers to, to really deeply understand. You managed to capture the daily indignities Black people faced in the South during the 1960s, as well as their humanity, their resistance through questioning, breaking unfair rules, fulfilling promises, forming friendships, and daring to dream and imagine a racially just world. I want to ask you, Michael, what does it mean to you to be a Black creator? Um, honored. I'm honored. And um, uh, without sounding Pollyannish, uh, I am humble and I'm moved when people, all walks of life, will email me, send me notes, uh, and say that thank you, they really appreciate it. 
something creative that comes from the labyrinth of your brain is out there in the universe. And I, I, I don't own it anymore. And I'm not talking about from a legal standpoint. Mm-hmm. But I don't own the notion once it leaves as a creator, once it leaves you and it goes out to where it goes, the, the, the wonderful nature of it all is that I can say that, wow, I created something, I wrote something, and someone is, thinks that it's important and it's made a difference. It's made a difference. Yeah. That's what being a Black creator is all about. Thank you, Michael. It's so lovely to talk to you. It's been a, a, a wonderful uh, time. Uh, thank you very much. I so appreciate this powerful dialogue and for you sharing your very personal and impactful life stories with us. Stories that will resonate with young readers and that belong in every classroom. Please join us in June for the next conversation in the Black Creators series. Our guests will be authors Victoria Bond and T.R. Simon, winners of the John Steptoe New Talent Author Award for the first book in their Zora and Me trilogy of middle grade novels centered around the childhood of Zora Neale Hurston. For a full schedule of conversations and links to an accompanying podcast, please visit blackcreatorseries.candlewick.com and check the Teachers College Reading Writing Project's Facebook page for past episodes. Thank you for joining us. 